All right, let's go. So we're up. This is the Anarchy Unleashed podcast, and I'm very delighted to introduce a very fine actor and a dear friend, Mr. Oliver Boot. Hello. <laughs> Oliver, it's been like how long since we saw each other? It's been like, a while. Yeah. It's been a while. I think the last time we saw each other, you were over at my house eating Thai food and getting very drunk, but that was probably about 18 months ago. It was a a while oh we've started with a cracking story yeah. now <laughs> i don't drink that much i don't like i don't drink i might have the odd whiskey every now and again <laughs> but i was like a teenager like thought i had to impress mr boot <laughs> and his your lady wife wife to be and um i drank too much i think we all did I yeah we all did we got very excited yeah <laughs> we ate some incredible food all these uh, like as well as being a high-end actor and i mean that by the way he's a and high-end chef, which makes sense. It kind of all makes sense, doesn't it? I suppose it's all creative, isn't it? And yep. it's, it's all part of that sort of creative gambit of things. And I think also, you know, the I think the reason why I went into being an actor was because I like to make people happy, mm. even if I'm making them sad or moving them in some way in a story or whatever. And I think the cooking is the same. It, you know, you get an instant reaction from it. They're like a live audience when, when you plate up and you feed people. You know, their reaction oh, is I what sort of sustains me in a weird way. I perfectly get that. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. But also, right, let's finish this story about yeah, me. <laughs> but the fucking bad influence that Oliver Boot is. That's why I haven't been around since. I'm still, I'm still recovering. I drank too much. Okay. Got the car home. Don't don't remember getting into the car. Um, I got out. <laughs> I haven't told you this. I, I got out of the car, the taxi, at our apartment building. And... um. First thing I did was oh, really? vomit. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> For some reason, I thought doing that oh, no. was going to just stop it from coming out. Oh. I literally stood there like that. You have your face and gave yourself a five-way spray. Brilliant. Sam was so impressed. I bet she was. And like, she like just looked at me like I've never been so attracted to you in my life. <laughs> so that wasn't the end of it. I told you this part. <laughs> It was a while ago. Next day, I had to get my first um, my first vaccination for old COVID. So I got no fucking sleep. Yes, I'm hungover. Tell me that. <laughs> and part of the process, or people remember or not, you get your jab and they sit you down for 15 minutes to make sure you're okay. I was fucking knackered and hungover. They sat me down. I'm literally like like this. Trying to, I'm, I'm like this anyway. Like... <laughs> Don't even know my own fucking name. So I'm, all I'm worried about is like just fucking collapsing of being hung over. And it fucked me. I bet it did. For the next five days, yeah, yeah. I could not yeah. I could not get out I of mean, bed. I mean, the vaccine kicked the shit out of me and I was sober when I yeah. and I can't imagine what it must have been like on a horrible wine yeah. hangover. Yeah, that thanks, man. Awful. You have my sympathy. I'm no, so I, sorry. I, don't, I don't really. <laughs> he's still on he's still <laughs> about getting me around to his house. Like, <laughs> fucking hell. Um... I will be there. I will be there. To be there. I um, think we were. I think we were also very overexcited, I just know. by the thrill of having made what we'd made, and yeah. you know the the sort of heady joy of having created something and put something in the bag together. And I, I think that was, you know, it was kind of a, an outpouring and a and a you know of of all that sort of pent up stuff that comes with making mm -hmm. a, a film. Yeah, and um, and I think we needed that that unleash. Yeah, you know, that, that release. Yeah, yeah, completely. So all for those who should know or don't know, Oliver is the co-lead in our film Liberté, which is currently playing on any network's History Division channel. Um, History Channel um, across the EMEA, so 77 countries worldwide. If you're in the UK, it's uh, Sky UK. And you can find it on demand for the next three years, which is great. Three so, years. That's yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Yeah, it's a really crazy story. And um, Ollie has been highly praised for his performance, um, quite rightly. And I'm not just saying that. And, um, watch the film, and you'll see that it's Ollie's playing a very difficult role. I'll say that. Not, on, not only because he has the majority of the dialogue, um, but he has the he's the character who has the majority of the dialogue, but can't take over the film yeah oh, that's yeah. what's tricky yeah i think i think it was 
I think even though with the majority of the dialogue, it always felt very important to me from the very minute we first met and started talking about it, that Sam's character, Nor, had had more to say than I did, mm. if that makes any sense at all. And there's a, there's a, there's a moment which I, I know I, I, I you know, it, there's a moment in the film which I, I blow so much smoke up your ass for because there was a brilliant reaction that you captured in her which i think is the moment when i say you don't even look like them mm. which was a, a really poignant and important moment and the look that comes across her face mm. in that moment weirdly i missed it because i was so involved in attacking her and belittling her and trying to 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 crush her in that moment that actually I, I weirdly missed it. And it was only when I watched the film back and I saw that response on her face and you're right close on her and you see it and it's, it, it, it washes across her. It's not a, a, a splash. It's like a wash of this, of this look that comes across her face. And, oh, it was glorious. And it, was, it said everything about the film that I wanted to try and achieve in that moment as my character, to let Nor and her reactions and her silence speak so many volumes and it was it was just a brilliant piece of editing on your part and i i'm sorry to blow smoke up your ass in this way but it, it really was and it was so exciting to to see it realized and and it was i i think i think the great thing was that we'd all come together when we first met because it was obviously cast via zoom because it was COVID at the mm. time and mm. we couldn't meet up in an enclosed space so we went and met in a square <laughs> somewhere in um Fitzrovia or I don't think you know this either. That is the area where Nora's uh, family home was. Oh really? Yes. Oh I didn't know that. Okay. It's random that we just wow, that I random. wonder if that was on purpose on our part. Probably. I, I can't remember. But Maybe. yeah. Yeah. But I remember we met in that square and we sat on a park bench, socially distanced, and, and sort of talked about what we thought our your thoughts, my thoughts, mm. Sam's thoughts were on this film and how we felt about the parts and what was to be considered and and i i tried to do as much research as i possibly could about her and about him and and to try and and find uh, whether our our thoughts and our ideas about the film kind of mash together because i think you know you are very powerless as an actor mm -hmm. in this industry i think you know the casting couch is a brutal thing and and self tapes are really cruel and horrible um and i think that that the only power you kind of have as an actor when you go and meet a director, if you get that far after all the self-taping, is to go, well, can I work with you? Mm -hmm. As much as you want to work with me, the power lies with, can I work with you? Do our ideas match? Um, and I found that the three of us sitting on that bench in that square, we all had exactly the same idea of what we wanted to achieve. And it was so serendipitous. And it felt like we were already speaking in a, um, you know, unwritten language with one another we had oh, this, I get it. this dialogue that, that just felt like we all knew what we wanted to achieve and it felt incredibly exciting after i walked away from that square i was i remember ringing my wife to be and saying god that was so um so uh exciting and so um uh, inspiring yeah when i found out that you wanted to work with me as much as i wanted to work with you guys i was i was really excited to try and bring it to life you know in the way that we you certainly did <laughs> oliver is like uh like he certainly did not to blow smoke up your ass, please i still haven't That's forgiven you for the <laughs> fucking wine night <laughs> uh we'll leave that um well look frankly like you came very highly recommended by the casting people um uh, stevie davies um yeah. particularly yeah. um and I'm not a. I do know who actors are. I do know people's work. Um, but I've been out of the loop a little bit with particularly. You've done a lot of theatre. Yeah, particularly yeah, a lot of theatre and a lot TV of and stuff. And yeah, yeah. randomly, you've worked on things early in your career that a couple of pe friends of mine have as well. Um, yeah, the first that uh, first movie. Um, John Carter John of Mars. Carter, yeah. yeah, yeah, the Disney, the Disney film. Yeah, mad, <laughs> mad. I don't know whether that's a good thing that I know like three people who worked on that. Well, I, I mean, honestly, I think I think everybody in the <laughs> UK at some point or another was called up for John Carter. It was a, 
you know, I mean, I, I think it is still to date the biggest flop in, yeah. in Disney movie history. Um, they spent $350 million on it, and I think they recouped 150 at box office. So it really, really didn't, didn't fly. And I mean, the, the, the problem was, was that you had someone like Andrew Stanton, who, mm-hmm. who was the director on it, who had incredible um, success with things like Wally and Finding Nemo. And he was an amazing studio director of, of actors, mm. but it was his first live action film. And, um, and I think it, he is a brilliant collaborator. Mm. He's a wonderful guy. I mean, fascinating and brilliant in many, many ways. And I think he was such a great collaborator that it, it reached the point where there were so many chiefs and not enough Indians on that movie that it kind of lost its way a bit. Yeah. Um and it and it got it got very diluted and you know it felt very exciting when we were doing it but the actual final product sort of you didn't feel anything for the journey of the characters and I remember walking out of the the screening there going oh it's it's not what I thought it was going to be it's not what I'd hoped and mm. I think everybody on that felt that way. Um but I I certainly think w- within the context of it everyone in London everyone mm. in England at some point was pulled into Pinewood and Shepperton Studios to work <laughs> on it. Um, and I mean, I was only meant to be on it for a, a, a couple of weeks and I'm I literally blink and you'll miss me. In the yeah. Film. Yeah. But it overran and it overran. And the, the part of the, that I was playing was, was Dominic West's bodyguard and, um, Mark Strong and I sort of had to morph in and out of each other during the course of the film. Um, and so, you know, I was meant to be on it for a week. Then I was, then it was two weeks. Then it was a month. Then it was three months. Then it was, you know, and it just went on and on and on and on. And I was just in every scene, um, just standing behind Dominic, looking buff because I'd had a personal trainer and had had to get yeah. sort of muscly for it. Yeah. And um, it, it just became one of the best paying jobs I'd ever done. Yeah. As a result of just being on set constantly. That's a big lesson. Yeah. Isn't it? Like, turn it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, turning up. One of the one of the things they say with big feature films, and I and I totally understand this now, is they pay you to wait. Yeah. Um. I used to go and sit in a trailer sometimes for days and days and days on end and not be used. And I'd be in, you know, we, we were yeah. fully sprayed. We had these incredible full body tattoos that had to be stenciled onto yeah. us, and we were we were sat there in these incredibly uncomfortable leather yeah. uniforms and armor and everything else. And I sat in a trailer for, for days and days and days at a time without being used, but just sat, you know, paid to wait. Just paid to wait for when they needed me. There you go, kids. <laughs> this is what you do. Get paid to wait. That, but that's that's the, the, the big lesson that, that, that you learn from that as an actor is you have sat on your ass for three days in a trailer. You've yeah. had no context of what's been going on on set, no energy from that. And then suddenly cu- someone comes, yeah. like, knocks on your door and goes, oh, we need you now. You get in a car, you get driven to the location, you walk onto these incredible sets and they go, right, go now. And you have to be laser focused. You have to know exactly what you're going to give and exactly what you're going to do. Because the the amount of money it costs to reset those cameras and to go again for two, three, four takes, if you're fucking it up, they won't ever employ you again. Mm. You need to be ready to fire at any given moment. And that's when the work is so important. That's screen acting right there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and, yeah. and you know, you you have to have everything built into your performance from, you know, your childhood, your subtext, your history, your background, your everything. What's just happened before that, what's about to happen, where you've come from, everything. You need to have it all there. The work has to have been done. You cannot turn up on a set like that and wing it, you know, and, and shame on you if you, if you do. That's the difference between a pro... <laughs> and an amateur, right? Well, you know, I, I think as I've got older as well, I've 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 learned to wing it less. You know, when I was younger, I was I was quite cocky, and I would walk onto film sets or, or TV sets. Right? Like, yeah, I've got this. You know, bang, 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 bang. I can I can knock this out. And a lot of television actors can and have that ability because they are a sort of one trick pony is is doing them a disservice. But no, they, I know. I know. They have I the know. ability to churn out that same sort of character thing on plus yeah you know, when they when they need it but for me i i, I want to be more than that i want to be yeah. a chameleon i want to be unrecognizable in the roles that i play and, and the things that i do and i want to be able to to turn out something that is exciting and interesting and unexpected and not sat directly in my center um and so um it becomes more of an artistic exercise when you're by yourself you know, and, and when you're working on those scripts and those those parts, you think how 
how can I really get under the, the skin of this and get to the bones of this and make it something really special and really artistic and beautiful and exciting to watch rather than just, you know, winging it and churning out something that everyone would expect. Do you think that you, you just try and do that with anything you have, no matter what? I, I think yeah. now, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly. I, I mean, like I said, when I was younger in TV, I just used to get a script, I'd rock up, I'd do it. Yeah, and, I'm all... and, you know, the other thing is they say that you will never be cast in something you're not absolutely perfect for. And so, you know, a lot of the time people will cast you because you are perfect for that role and it's not too far removed from you. Mm. But then I think it's it's in those moments that you can excel rather than just be kind of mediocre and fulfill the brief and do the job. You know, now for me, it's about excelling and about finding something really interesting and really exciting in my work. And that 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 inspires me and gives me my bread and butter. That's my nourishment. You know, if I don't do that, then why am I doing this? You know, that's a very good point. I mean, what's it for then? Yeah, what what's it for? Fucking money. I mean, Jesus, you know, you spend <laughs> Mr. Disney here. <laughs> you spend a lot of your time. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. You spend I a know. lot of your time hand to mouth or, or broke. Yeah. If you're not, you know, in that top 1% of the big movie guys, yeah. or, you know, you're not regularly working in television in this country. Yeah. You know, you're, you're living paycheck to paycheck as yeah. an actor. And, you know, if you're a jobbing actor, you know, great. That's, that's a, you're earning a living at yeah. what you've chosen to do. But, but then, but then, you know, if you're, if you're not using it as an opportunity to enrich and better yourself, then go and go and do something, go and do anything else. Yeah. You know, if you, if you cannot hand on your heart, say act or die, then, then go and do anything else because yeah. the, the industry is, is so hard and so competitive and so brutal. You know, the amount of criticism and no's and terrible shit that gets thrown your way. You know, you have to be able to be resilient and and know that this is the only thing that will make you happy and the only thing that nourishes your soul. Because otherwise, fuck, do anything else. Yeah. I mean, they used to say that when we went to, well, you went to RADA, I went to GSA. They like, yeah. said that, said yeah. that there. Yeah. Probably a good point to go on to the, the main question, actually. We'll go back to Liberty a little bit. Okay. Um, but the main question about quitting, I mean, I've been asking everyone so far, like, When's the last time you wanted to quit and what stopped you from quitting? Because that's a very, very good Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Because people may need, to, yeah. everyone wants to quit maybe at some point, but what stops? Oh, yeah. What's I the th difference? I think there's been, a, there's been, I mean, a, yeah, a lot of the time there are moments in this where you go, ah, oh, I just, you throw your hands up and you're frustrated and you go, oh, fuck this. I just want to quit. You know, mm. I'm, I'm not going to do this. And then there are those couple of big moments in your life where you go, I want to quit. I absolutely want to quit. Fuck this. Um, and I um, I think for me, I had finished doing a world tour of King Lear mm -hmm. um, with the Globe. Um, and it was, it had been very plaudited and uh, they wanted to take it to America to do a tour around America and finish in New York. Yeah. And um, I had been paid shit, like mm. terrible money, terrible, terrible money. Um, and, you know, people go, oh, well, it, it was sort of... A, act as equity minimum and that kind of stuff you know i couldn't pay my mortgage i was having to subsidize doing this job hmm. you know by by finding other ways and credit cards to subsidize yeah. my mortgage you know um and i turned around to them and they said we, we it's been really plaudited we've loved your performance we've loved everything you've done in it it's now been picked up by america they want to take around america and finish it in new york really really exciting would you like to do it and i said to them okay i cannot pay my mortgage I'm really, really struggling with the wage that you're paying me. If you can pay me 50 pounds more a week, 50 pounds more a week for a play that they have made a ton of money on. I'm not bad mouthing, bad mouthing the globe in any way. You know, they, they have their, their levels and they have their limits of what they want to pay people. And that is absolutely fine. But I said to them, you know, I need this in order to continue to work for you. And they said, no, we won't give you that. And then they came back to me and they, and I, and I sort of stopped. And I was like, okay, so I'm not worth an extra 50 quid a week. Okay. Um, so I had to seriously consider it. And then they came back to me and they said, if you don't decide today, then we'll move on. And I was like, oh, am I that easily replaceable? And I went, okay, fine, move on then. I called their bluff and they dropped me like that. And then I didn't work for a year. Wow. And as that year progressed, I got incredibly depressed. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get a job. I could not get a meeting. I, I, and the meetings that I did get were completely 
unsuitable for me. I felt like the agency I was with at the time had just given up on me. They weren't introducing me to new people. They, I, I was, I was floundering really, really badly. I got more and more depressed. I think I had a bit of an emotional breakdown. Yeah. Um, I really hit rock bottom. I was drinking too much. I was punishing myself. Um, my relationship at the time fell apart. Um, it was, it was really, really, things were really, really bad. I was absolute rock bottom. And then, uh, weirdly, I got a casting for the Globe um, to do Richard II, mm. um, which was with Charlie Edwards, and it was sort of they're going to be their big piece for the year. Um, and I went along and I auditioned, and they offered it to me. And it wasn't Bolingbroke, which I'd gone in originally for, but I think I was again in such a bad place that I'd fuck the audition up and. I think the director saw something in me and went, um, okay, you know, you can play, you can obviously act, but I'm not going to trust you with Bolingbroke. So he offered me another smaller part in it. Um, and uh, and it, it, I, I accepted it. And I went along to the first day of rehearsals and I was deeply depressed and deeply unhappy. And all through rehearsals, I was quiet and withdrawn and morose. And I stepped on to do that performance in the rehearsal room in the first week. And I suddenly felt it again. I felt nourished and alive. And I was so unhappy. And this character at one point gets banished from England and sent to France. Mm -hmm. And he has to fall to his knees and break down and sob. And during this, this moment say, you know, why, why can I not do this? You know, why have you banished me? Banishment is the worst possible thing. You're destroying my life. Everything, everything that I'd felt at the time, the breakdown of my relationship, the, the depression and everything else could, could come out in this performance. And it was so serendipitous and I was so raw and so angry. And I absolutely killed that part. I killed it. And everyone who came to see it in the reviews and everything, you know, and it was a small part and I was getting mentioned in these reviews and I was yeah. getting mentioned to, you know, and, and everyone who came to see it were going, Jesus, you, you fucking killed it. And the reason I killed it was because it was, it was nourishment again to the soul. I was able to vent all of my pain and my angst and my hurt and my upset through this role. And then immediately after that, I got cast as Bill Sykes in Oliver um, mm. before I'd even finished that job. And I, and I went on and I did Bill Sykes. And again, the anger, the volatility, the pain, the angst, the, the hurt that makes Bill Sykes. And that's when Stevie saw me, mm -hmm. um, who recommended me to you because he'd seen something that I was able to again vent this pain and this anger and this hurt through that. And then before I'd finished that, I got cast in something else. And it was like suddenly the, yeah. the industry was coming back and saying, oh no, it's okay. You're not worthless. You're not useless. You're not irreplaceable but also i think the industry likes you a bit damaged and i and i think yeah, isn't that interesting isn't that yeah interesting that the, yeah. the damage and the pain and the upset was what actually got me back into work yeah and, and kept me working and i was able to vent all of that hurt through those three four jobs that i then got back to back um and and use that artistic uh vent to, to sort of reinvigorate and re-nourish and re-inspire me. And it became this sort of cyclical thing of as I, as I vented, I got better and better and better. And, and fe uh, in, this, in the sense of feeling better and better. Mm. And, better. Um, and it changed my acting forever. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not the same actor I was when I was doing King Lear. I mm. had to break down. I had to hit rock bottom. I had to fall apart and be destroyed in order to then rebuild myself as, as the actor I am now. And, and it may well happen again. But but I'm but I'm prepared for it, you know, and yeah. and and if that happens, I'll know this time that that there is a light, there is a way of climbing back out, and it's through the work, and that's why I'm so passionate about doing the work now, because that's mm. what nourishes me and fulfills me. So. Wow! <laughs> wow! Not what you're expecting. It's, it's exactly not ex exactly what I want. <laughs> it's ex it's just that's a lesson. It's a lesson big time. I, th I think I think at your most broken, you can you become your most honest self. Right. I can relate to and that. And I think yeah. you look at yourself in the mirror and go, okay, how how do we get out? How do we do this from here, Ollie? And it, it's a thing about self parenting. You know, I, I my my parents my father died when I was very young. Yeah. And my yeah. mum, who is a wonderful, incredible human being, is is very um 
ethereal and and was obviously dealing with her own grief at the time and all that kind of stuff and so yeah. i learned from quite a young age to self-parent and yeah. i think that idea of looking at yourself in the mirror and going okay if i was my parent talking to me right now what would mm. i say to myself how would i encourage me to to carry on and to and to to, to climb my way out of this yeah and it took a lot of self-parenting jesus <laughs> <laughs> Well, I for one, I'm happy that you did. Oh yeah, me too. If not selfishly, because you're so he's so great in the film, like I'm, <laughs> but because we got to we got to know each other pretty well, yeah. and you know yeah, through that well. yeah right. since, and like, you're a friend as well. I and there was that same anger in, in Hans. There was yeah. that same anger, that same rage. Yeah, you know he had it, and it and it, you tap into it, you know, and yeah. it, he he had that. Very yeah. manipulative, frustrated, angry human being. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, which is harder to play than it might look. It's not yeah. all yelling. You no, know what no, I mean? No, not, not at all. Quite I can break it down. Yeah. Quite the opposite. Take it seriously. Randomly, like, you've got five minutes, but randomly, I. The original SIS guys are being named now, right? From the 40s. Like, because um, they did that SAS show. And did you see the SAS? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was incredible been a newspaper article like half of the original SAS come from where I come from this <laughs> man <laughs> because of Paddy Main probably and then I think yeah, about yeah, that because Paddy yeah. Main he's like a, the story came out that a couple of guys from my hometown were involved in that and I think they were part of the SAS group that was murdered by him wow is that what he murdered he SAS guys didn't he yeah, and, he yeah. and killed yeah, him yeah. yeah he did there were um, I think it was a, a woodland outside of yeah uh, French town, and he made them dig their own graves. Yeah, yeah. And there were 15 of them. Yeah. 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 <sighs> he was a, a really seriously angry, unwell guy. But Oliver, <laughs> it's weird saying his full name. I was thinking, <laughs> calling myself Christopher. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, the difference between Oliver and the character he plays, it's like it's very. T and I think, you know what? That's it's probably the reason why. You were cast as well, not just because of your talent and the, the fact that you could play the part, but the fact is that you are as warm and kind as you are. Because I could have went down the cold person in real life who's cold and withdrawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I think there's nothing more unsettling than somebody who s says they're going to kill you with a smile. You know that that yeah. sort of warmth. You know, a lot of the time That's they were we saying wanted. that he would come out of the interrogation rooms and him and the person he was interrogating would have their arms around each other and would be talking about how they were going to meet up after the war, you know, and uh, two yeah. weeks later he would have them executed, you know, but he was so manipulative because he was so um, unsettlingly clever mm. at making people feel so at ease. He was so socially agile that that, that was part of his sort of mechanism, uh, uh, the mechanism of a psychopath. You know, is to make you feel so comfortable and so at ease just before they, they plunge a knife in your back. You know, and that's exactly the kind of person he was. And so I wanted to get that across with him, was that warmth and that, you know, I, I'm 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 here to help you. You know, I'm I, I, I'm not interrogating you. I'm trying to help you. You know, and it's um, yeah, it it, it, it hides and buries a much more sinister ulterior motive, and that has to sort of ring and bubble underneath all of that. Yeah, it certainly yeah. has. I was saying to Sam, your co-star and the writer and producer, yeah. co-producer, that yeah, she is. She's brilliant. None of that. That film isn't work. Doesn't work if you're out of. You're both out of sync, yeah. and you're not, you're both not. If you're not bringing, if you're just, if you're at ninety nine point nine percent, it's not. Wouldn't be enough because yeah. it's just the two of you. How scary is that? Because yeah. of that, it's, a, it's on a knife edge. Yeah. Your shoulders to, to Fuck make yeah. sure that you you capture that. And she was so brilliant in her focus. Yeah, you know. A, a, I've, I've worked with actors that when the turnaround comes and it's on your single, they're playing with their phone or nails yeah, yeah, yeah. or doing something yeah. else, you know, and they have no interest in your performance or, yeah. or what you're doing. And, and it's incredibly ungenerous and very, very unprofessional, I think. Yeah. So when the camera was on Sam, I was giving her everything I possibly could so that she could fight back and shout without words in her performance. And, and when the camera flipped around on me, she was staring at me and just giving me everything I needed to try and, and return that, that energy and, and it, it I think it works really well um and you know a lot of the time you do performances and you go god that was electric and that was amazing and you watch it back and it's flat and you go oh, what happened there and all. you know and 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 there were moments in this where where it felt so electric and I was like oh please let that please let that 
He's like, right, I'll, well, I'll, finish, I'll end with this one then. Yeah. When we, it's going back to the beginning, that scene that you were talking about um, where you say you don't even look like them, yeah. that, that scene. Um, the take we use in the cut, I think on both sides, it's just one of the takes. I think it was take three right. on both sides. Okay. I didn't use any other part. Yeah. Any other, I didn't cut in because... Take, was it take three or take two? Take two? Might have been take two. It was, it sorry, take yes. Two. It was take three on almost every other scene randomly right, okay yeah yeah but yes um we did that scene and the room was kind of it was after lunch wasn't it? Yeah. it was after lunch yeah, right yeah. it was after lunch yeah. and the room was kind of not full but we had some set visits from crew not some random people yeah and um, the costume directors sean and sean and right. Stevie had come right to see it too so they decided to stay yeah for an hour <laughs> and um the pressure on them I got, I got nervous yeah i got nervous yeah yeah and um i could tell a little bit um did the first take. It's great. I mean, the, the, the this, we were on it because we rehearsed, and it, sure, was, yeah, yeah. it was every take. Of, quite, quite frankly, is usable, so it's sure, it's great. Sure. But it was always take three most of the time. Yeah. But for this one, it was take two. So you did the first take of the final scene. Um, we call it the Calais scene, and it's just it's it's Noor and Kiefer their final kind of showdown until she's taken away. Yeah. And um. You did the first take. I'm like, oh, cool. But part of me, like, could feel that your anxiety a little bit yeah, yeah, um, yeah. with them because... I mean, it's a big scene and... There's, it's a big um, scene it's a anyway. Big scene and it's the first time the crew are really seeing you stretch your legs yes. emotionally as, as that character and you feel the pressure of that. And, yeah. you know, ego take, can step in and I, I think you have to have a certain amount of ego to, to get up in front of people. You do. But also you have to have enough lack of ego that you can put it aside at that moment and just live without the idea of, of third eyes on you. And um, and so my ego had just sneaked over the line a bit and I was a bit self-aware on that first take. Yeah, but yeah, you, you would only notice after you've said that, right? It was one of those takes. And But I knew I just had a feeling that yeah, yeah. he's got this next one, is, this next one is it. And you remember what I said I and I can't exactly remember as mu much, but my whole theory of being a director on a film set or even an actor is, it's the same as being a boxing coach. I don't like to waste time. Sure. As a boxing coach, which I do, in that corner, I've got 60 seconds to give notes, really. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For take yeah. two. Yeah, of course, yeah. Round two, or take two. Yeah, yeah. Or take yeah. nine. Um, but, I would, yeah, like I said, I like to be very kind of saying I think, yeah, I just I just knew you just had to just basically fuck everything in the room, right. fuck everyone else, just let do yourself you, go. Do you remember what you said to me? Remind me, yeah, it was. You said to me. Take all the time you need. That was it. Take all. This is this is your. This is your time. This is your moment. Take all the time you need. If you and you and I think you said to me, if you finish a line and you want to wait five minutes before you say the next one, take all the time you need. And that's all I needed was to go. This is your platform. This is your time. Take as much time as you need. T to 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 go through the emotional journey. Yeah. And and it it. It's, it, it was it, it set it off like a fucking did like because it. if I just showed you your your shot yeah it fucking flies yeah, you're yeah, all yeah. like on it yeah, yeah. and isn't that weird Which how is weird because yeah, I was taking because, all the time I needed right <laughs> but it was faster than but, the first take right something like that kind of opens yeah. up something yeah which it's hard literally that scene is amazing why at least let's fucking skip to the end of the film <laughs> Um, but watch that scene because it is just that one take. Yeah. I haven't caught with any other take. And they're so connected. Ollie and, and Sam and Sam delivers that look at the end too. And it's because of what you were giving her. And it's um, it's a real... You read about this stuff on sets where like people finish the take and everyone's like, oh, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, <sighs> <laughs> Part of me wants to be a little rebel and go fuck this shit. Just yeah. get get the fucking scene done. This yeah. go home. I'm not really like that, but like I get emotionally attached to people, right? Um, but literally, f oh, Ollie probably didn't. You probably didn't see this, but I think I told you after finish the scene, and I was at the, the monitor going. <laughs> then I I turned around and the casting directors um 
Stevie and Sharon were there at the back and they weren't looking at me they were just this was a natural reaction from them they literally turned around smiling and high fiving <laughs> everyone in that room knew that was it I don't think we did another take no, we didn't. We didn't pass it. it was fun it's just it's one of those moments where everything just it fell perfectly into place it did yeah. at the right moment because yeah. that's a very pivotal scene it's, it's the end of the film so important I knew how important it was and I wanted to get it right for you yeah but very good lesson. Just take all the time that you need. Fuck, like, let's be basic. But fuck everyone else. Yeah, yeah. Because we worry so much if we're good people, which you are. If you're sure. a good person, am I wasting people's time? Or, sure. but sometimes I think that's the only w- role of the director's role is yeah. in that moment is to just yeah. say that versus, oh, I kind of, what are we talking about? You look, like, what's he thinking about? And because you, we already talked about that, I and mean, we already know that, it's just get down to the. We've got. I've got sixty seconds to give yeah, you what you yeah. need, and you need to understand what I'm saying in sixty seconds. Absolutely. Because then you're going out for round two, yeah. and you're going to finish this fight. Like yeah. if I can, do a Rocky <laughs> reference, but, and that's what you did. One of the most interesting things that recent phrases that I've come up with in my work is, if your art makes someone else uncomfortable, that's their problem, not yours. And I think that, that in that moment, like I said, with ego and being self-aware, we're all very self-aware nowadays of yeah. worry about what people think about us and how we look and all that kind of stuff. But actually, when you're being an artist and you're being creative and you're acting, if what you're doing makes someone else feel uncomfortable, that's their problem, not yours. Mm. And that frees you. It frees you entirely to just be, to live, mm. because you, you are no longer beholden to anybody else, just your own art, your own work. That's a hell of a line to end on. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you to Mr. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really wonderful to sit and chat to you. Yeah, I really appreciate this because Ollie isn't, I'm just bringing on people who don't want to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Ollie doesn't necessarily like doing interviews and stuff and talking about himself as much maybe, but Uh, he's here. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Don't forget, like, subscribe. Share, share the video. Check it out, anarchyactors.com. Um, check out the company, Anarchy Inc., Doc Studio. Check out Mr. Oliver Boot, but are you on social media a lot or not? Uh, n- not really, no. Um, you can check out my IMDb profile if you want to see the work that I've done. Yes, um, do that. Oliver Boot. I'm going to see him in something. Yeah, yeah. Watch yeah. the film, Liberty. You can watch it on Sky History UK and in 77 countries worldwide. Um, and um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bless you. Yes. Yes.